Simply what I do is, I'm like all consultants, I borrow your watch and tell you the time. Um, and I'm not being completely facetious in saying that, in that it's, we collect a lot of information um, and feed it back. And I think that's, that's often uh, what we do. What we've heard is, um, is it some top-down approach, some bottoms-up approach and some stories. And, and as individuals, we are all different sorts. Um, some people love the numbers and, and the bottoms up. Some people like to go out in the field like Lacey and measure it. And if it's not measured, it doesn't exist. Um, uh, some of us like to start with the big picture and distill down to the important things. Um, none of them are right, but all of them on their own are wrong. Um, and you have to put the different bits together uh, when, when we're looking at it. And, and what we've heard is, is from Troy, we've heard about what some of the big, you know, the principles are. And then he jumped into the theoretical, the, the gross margins and doing the approach from there. And then we've, then we've heard, you know, the practical of um, approach. And it's trying to, to get that information in a way that's, that's useful to us. Um, and I always have a saying, stories without the numbers are bullshit and numbers without the stories are also bullshit. You've actually got to put the two together. Um, and if I hear a story and I don't get the numbers, I don't, you know, there's been a number of times I've read stuff in the Stock and Land or the Weekly Times about someone's story and I've seen their balance sheet and they don't mix, mix um, often um, is the case. Anyway, I want to just start with the, with the big picture with, with uh, uh, with, with a bit of stuff on water. Just before I do though, anyone, what's the question about water that's, that's at the front of your brain at the moment? How much water are they gonna take off us? <laughs> yes, next. What's the price of water gonna be next year? Next. How much do you think we'll get? <clears throat> next. Yeah, I'd be interested to know what the mix is. So if you see water's about $2 a meg at the moment, Next. How much do I buy? Next. I'm going to lose 50% of my water. Sorry? I'm going to lose 50% of it because we're going to get 110% allocation. Yep. Next. Anything yet, David? Will, will the uh, value of permanent water go up or down with buybacks? Yep. Uh, I'd like to see um, um, down the track what's the best way to utilise that water is whether it's actually using it on the farm or using it on the farm. Okay, that's a whole stack of questions. I'll try and cover uh, most of them, but I'll see if I can pick them up as we go through. But what I want to do is and start with a bit of a framework. And when we talk about water, we all talk about them with a different time frame. And we often argue, or we, we, we actually don't, we don't communicate very well because we're actually talking about different times. And for example, um, the spiritual framework or the 40,000 of indigenous or in Christian terms, 2,000 years, years ago of Christ, um, we think in those terms of, of, our, of our emotional or our spiritual attachment to water. Um, and it's probably something that, that we're yet to learn from the indigenous about that, that, that concept. Um, and I throw that out there, I'm not going to talk about that today, but that's one, that's one way we look at it. And in fact, those of you who are in the Christian tradition, that also influences the way you look at the world and, and things. The next one is a lifespan, sort of my life and, and my grandfather's life, because I spoke to my grandfather and I knew him. So there's, there's 100 years of, of sort of water that that we can experience and we can sort of see what's happened over there. And in particular, climate change, I believe, is in that framework of timing. And, and people sometimes think I'm a climate change denier, but I want to put it into its, into its perspective of when we're debating and when we're talking, because it's too easy to say climate change is everything, whereas we need to put it into its, into its longer term. And in particular, in our water, Federation or um, drought is a really key defining thing in the, in the Australian water history. And, and for those of you who don't know that, that one of the key reasons that we got a 
states became federation was the drought. We had to come together to actually have an agreement. And that was part of, a part of the underlying of federation. And, and some of the principles in water sharing today go back to that time. And when I work overseas, and I've been doing a lot overseas recently in all sorts of countries, it's made me understand that 100 years of history and federation. And I'll come back to that. Now, the other one is when we, the Murray-Darling Basin Plan expresses water in LTDLE terms. It used to be um, cap figures, etc., but that's the current value. So when we value how much water there is, it's done in those terms. And the Murray general security is 69.9% is the average value in LDTLE. What that says is that over 100 years, with general security, you would expect that you would get, on average, that's your allocation. And that's the, that's the unit that's being used. Um, and it's, that's important to think in those terms because Murray Basin Plan talks in those terms and we talk about five years. We're interested in what we get over the next last 20 years, not over 100 years. So that's the difference. The next one is a generation. Now 20 years is actually a very key time frame for water. If I think about my three lots of 20 years, when I was growing up, the 20 years where we were developing, we were shifting from sheep and wheat to, to um, ir uh, pastures and cattle and sunflowers. And I'm fascinated you grow sunflowers again because back in the 70s, you know, we, we were, that was when we shifted to them. And that was the heady days of development. And then we went into the 80s and 90s, the, you know, after the wet years. And, and that 20 years, in particular over here, where you just, you shifted to rice and you just went hell for leather with rice for that 20 years. And that was what dominated. Now, the last 20 years, we've seen the drought, we've seen basin plan, we've seen water trading. This 20 years. What's the next 20 years going to be? What's the next generation? And, and you made the comment that your son wants to go full-time farming. I suspect there might be another generation and there'll be more off-farm income because you're going to, if the business is going to grow to the scale that it's going to have to grow for the next generation. Um, then we go into the wet and dry cycle periods, the five years. And, and really, projects on the farm are about a five-year project. You know, your, your um, uh, laser grading or your redoing of paddocks and stuff, you've got a few years that you're looking at planning. And then you have the individual years and you respond to each year. So when you're thinking about it, we often get caught up in the individual we forget about the five year, and we don't often have a 20 year horizon when we think about where we're heading. So that's just sort of uh, in the debate, because um, what I want to do is look at this one. This is the inflows into the Murray over the last 120. And you'll see the headlines, the last 20 years was 40% below the long term average. Yes. Statistically, that is a nonsense statement. You cannot compare 20-year averages with 100-year averages, right? Because if you compare the last 20 years with the Federation drought 20 years, there's actually only 7% difference. What we've got is if you look at that 20 years uh, before the turn of the century average, and you look at the 20 years since, there is a, a quite a big difference in water. Now the next 20 years, what's it going to be? Which one of those are we going to get? Right? If I knew the answer to that, we could all go and make squillions, couldn't we? And, and the only thing I can say is that it's going to be a 20 year period and it could be wet or it could be dry. And how are you focused in terms of dealing with that over the next 20 years? Right? Now, the key is the way we behaved. The 20 years before the turn of the century, when there was plenty of water, this district just went hell for leather with rice. That's the way you responded. This last 20 years, you had to be flexible, you had to change, you had to switch, you had to do all sorts of things. What's the next 20 years going to be? Because that's going to sort of strategically tell you what you're going to be doing. Now, I've put up here 
the allocations for the since 96, 97. The yellow is the high allocations, the uh, red is the disasters, and the the orange is the sort of average numbers. And you can see there that we've been managing some very, in a, if, if five years or three to four years is when you do a project, timing in life is everything. And if you do the project for the wrong time in that, in that period, it's like buying the farm next door. If you have two good years after you buy it, it's the best decision you ever made. And if you have two shit years afterwards, it's the worst decision you ever made, right? So that's what you're dealing with. In terms of where we are today, we're in a wet cycle, aren't we? And, and next year's gonna be, probably there's gonna be plenty of water too, not, a, sorry, this coming year and then the following year because it takes a while to wash out. After that, it's big question mark. So we can sort of have a bit of an idea for two years of where we are. And the same in, in the dry. In terms of, of this last year, how many people could have used more water this last season than they did? All right. How many people couldn't have used? How many people absolutely used every bit of water that they, they could possibly have done this last year? I bet you did. No? Sorry? Could have put some more in? Couldn't have done any more. Couldn't have done any more, right? Because it's the good years when you make money. And John over here has got 50 bucks in his pocket and I'm gonna get it off him. And he's, how often, if I tried to take 50 bucks off every one of you, I think I'd have a bloody nose, all right? Now, if I put, where are we? This 50 bucks on the ground out here. Whoever gets there first can have it. I'm serious. Come on. <laughs> As human beings, psychologically, right, we spend so much energy on hanging on to the 50 bucks. And we spend very little energy or less, about a third. And all the psychological studies that have been done in all sorts of things say that we spend about a third of, as much energy on seizing opportunities as, as we do in protecting losses. We're far more orientated to hang on, to not lose. But in all seriousness, think about that. Um, uh, we really do not seize the opportunities and in you, in, when you're dealing with this here, this is about grabbing opportunities in, in, in general security. When you've got a variability, you're gonna go hell for leather and you've gotta actually take a few risks, which traditionally we haven't done as much. In the year, when you're going out of the dry into a wet, You've got to take a bit of a gamble and occasionally you might lose, right? Because if you don't gamble, you won't win. If you haven't got the fishing line in the water, you can't catch a fish. So with hindsight, if you'd put that extra rice in, you would have made some more money, right? And now that water that you could have used is spilt. It's gone, lost, which is where you are, right? So understanding, seizing that opportunity in a variable environment. And that's unique to this Murray Irrigation, right? It's different in Northern Victoria, it's different down the river, and it's different in Murrumbidgee. This is, this is a characteristic of where you're farming in, in this particular area. So when you're talking about water trade and how you behave, that's, that's that one. The other one is business growth. I used to say that you could, you could uh, almost match, you could understand how many farm businesses are by just the Finley uh, school population. If you think about the population as it increased up to the 70s here at the school, and then in the 80s and that, it was stable, 
because whilst farm numbers decline all the time, the increase in water use offset it and enabled us to stay there. And now it's just gone down. Dairy farms in Australia since, nine, since the Second World War have halved every 20 years. The Northern Victoria in the last 20 years, because they've had half the water and you're halving the number of farmers every 20 years, there's a quarter. There is a quarter of the number of farmers in 20 years. And so what's happening is that, unfortunately, half of the farmers in this district will not be farming and will not be businesses in 20 years' time. That's, that's the world we live in. Now, we can have a philosophical debate about whether that's good or bad or whatever, but, you know, God help you if you fight it. The only thing you can do is we introduced irrigation. That changed it for quite a while. We changed from from grazing to rice, that's changed it, right? And if we all went to horticulture, we could change it overnight here. But with variable water supply, we can't. So I've seen sort of three lots of 20 years. What's the next 20 years? Well, the last 20 years, it was harder. But the asset value underpinned our ability to expand. That change in water values and, and land value was something quite unique to the last 20 years. So while you battled with some variable profits and some pretty average years, the underlying asset value was what enabled you to keep grow growing your business. Is that going to happen the next 20 years? Um, and if we have the 450 and more buyback, yes, it will in water. If we don't, I don't believe it will. And therefore, it's going to be quite a challenge in the next 20 years as to how you, how you um, adapt and grow your business. And whether you just go back to conventional, you've got to make profits in order to buy more land and more water. Because one thing's for sure, the farms will be bigger in 20 years' time. Now, get big or get out. I'm not saying you have to get big or get out. We saw from the work there that... that bigger farms, smaller farms, it's that. But if you look at the average over the time, in 20 years time, the average size will be twice in production. And it mightn't be in land, it might be in value of production. And that's what switching to different things. Um, and within that, we've got to deal with this five years of growth. So anyone who bought a property a couple of years ago, has been going hell for the leather the last couple of years, goes hell for leather this couple of years, is probably laughing, right? Um, now, the other one is, you've got to understand where you are, and that is that we've got, there's three different types of water. Water ain't water. Water has a reliability around it. And within the Southern Basin, there is about 1,500 gigs of water, which is there every year. Right? Not necessarily here, but within the basin. There's about 1,500 that's there most years. And there's about 2,000 which is there occasionally. Right? And fundamentally, you're dealing with this bottom group in the Murray Irrigation. There's a little bit of it goes into the second category. Um, and you've got a very tiny bit in the, in the high reliability stuff but mostly your water is, is in that bottom grit. It's a bit in the, in the secure. So that's the game you're in. That's the trade you're in. We've talked a bit about knowing your values, but do you know the, 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 the your enemy? I mean, what is it? You, uh, you get your enemies closer or something? Um, so do you know your alternatives in terms of water and what they're making? Um, and the relativity, and the comment was made, well, I'm worried about the almonds. Um, do you know how much money per megalitre an almond makes? And I just deal in gross dollars per megalitre. The, the profits per in every system that's functioning is roughly the same as a percentage. So if you just know the gross dollars <coughs> per megalitre, you can compare. And the, the almonds, good heavens, I haven't even got them up there, have I? Yes, I have, sorry. 1,600 to 2,000. 
Corn crops this year, I've known someone who's got about 1700 bucks this year on corn. Um, they're up there with the almonds. The almonds are not as good a profit as you think they are. What the almonds have got and what wine grapes have got and what you've got is that you can use megalitres per labour unit. Wine grapes and almonds are mechanically harvested. Why did wine grapes take off in the mid 90s? Because we introduced mechanical harvesting. It was that labour that did it. You've got it in your industries um, that you can get megalitres per labour unit. And so if you start doing seed crops and really top crops, you're up there with almonds in, in competing. The almonds are at, a, at an interesting uh, level. So understanding the enemy, right? And I've got, there's some more detailed about tons and everything if you want to have, look at some of that. Just, just to understand that you're in the connected Murray. When water trading started, what happened was that people were able to develop in new areas. And we traded water at the margins. We still only trade water at the margins. Most water is used where it's allocated. Um, and it's in the margins that it trades. And so what's happened is that since 2000, and I haven't got the last two years on the rice, so you know the, the rice industry don't shoot me, it's got a couple of nice good better ones on the right hand side there, but you can see the difference in there. You can see what's happened to the dairy industry and I've got another year or two there, but the dairy industry did the same and is now halved right? and settled down. There's horticulture. Horticulture has, has increased by about 40% in that same time in that area. It's not monstrous, but it's at the margins and they want the super secure water. They must have that water. And there's a limit to how much of that super secure water is. And in 1920, we hit the limit. If horticulture expands much more downstream than it is, the next drought, there will not be enough water and there'll be a crisis. You can just see it coming a mile away. So if we have some wet years, there'll be some fool's paradise and there'll be some development. The next wet year is what, the uh, next drought, if you're going to have a dry year, you might as well have a decent one and shake out the competition. So in some sense, you want a, you want a drought to shake out the, the, the almond industry sooner rather than later. The longer it is, the more they're going to gradually develop and then there'll be a bigger crisis. Um, so there are your three industries. I haven't got cotton there, but you know the story. Um, Carry over. There's a lot of data up there and, and you can have a copy and you can go and look at it in, at your leisure. The carryover story is not what Abear is trying to tell you it is. Right? It's a very different story because there are there are a number of different players. But just in simple terms, that if you look at the connected Murray, if you look at this column here, you'll see that. We've gone from 850, 900, up to 1400, 900, 600, 900, and then the last two years we've kicked up. That's the total amount of carryover. Remembering that about 5,000 is the maximum, the average, sorry, the average usage in that basin is about 3,500. So this is as a proportion of 3,500. And you can see there, there's a minimum of about, um, 600 and the funny thing is in 1920 the driest year we increased carryover people got scared and increased it for next year in 1920 so there's but if you look at victoria victoria last year and this year has not increased all the increase in carryover is in new south wales in there there's a lot of information in there um, we could have a whole session on carryover, but what I want to say is that there's different people. There's the horticulture industry that use carryover as insurance. They pay it every year and they never use it. It just sits there. There's an averaging. The dairy farmers treat it very differently to you. They're looking purely at price and how they can, can leverage and keep their average price down. 
And so they're, they're looking at it in a price sense this year, next year, grain prices, etc. Cropping industry has a two year horizon. You use it today or you use it tomorrow, but we've got to use it quick. So you're using carryover in most cases to just get as much hectares as you possibly can, which is a different way of thinking. Then there's the unused water carryover where by, by you, you, whoever it was, didn't, uh, didn't use all they could have this year and you've got some left over or it rains in autumn, right? So there's an unused bit. And then the other one that's in there, which is not recognised well, is that Murray Irrigation, Colliamberley and Bidgee have a conveyance volume that they, that's always included in the carryover numbers. And Murray Irrigation tells you what it is. Murray Irrigation is by far the best of the three of them in, in information. Murrumbidgee and Collie won't tell you how much it is. And so you can't, we can't work out how much water is privately owned and how much is in the, in the organisations, but that's quite a significant part of it. This is ABARES, I've just got to have a little dig. Uh, this is ABARES diagram on, on carryover. They say in dry years, um, we, uh, we, we mine it in uh, typical years, we don't, and in wet years, we, we store it. Um, over the last seven or eight years, that has not, we've, we've done the opposite. In, uh, we've done both that and the opposite. It's quite, it's, it's interrelated between the five different people, uh, groups. Sorry. Yeah, go on. Yeah, but dominantly, you people here are croppers and your income is determined by the maximum number of hectares you can crop and, and carry over if you carry, a, sorry, the other thing is, the more you use carry over, the less total water is used, the more spills we have. So the more spills we have is lost opportunity. So you as, an, as a group, um, uh, are try yes, you, you're using carryover a bit as an insurance for next year, but, but really you, you're just doing it to, to get as much crop as you can. You're not doing it to keep your cows alive. You're not doing it to keep your trees alive, right? Um, you're just trying to, in that market, I would argue. Um, some of you will have seen this graph that I keep, keep coming up and every year I think it's broke and every year the, the, the numbers keep coming back into the same spot. This is looking at it a long term, but all we're doing is taking the Murray irrigation price. And the reason we use that is it's the only true price. All the others, you, you actually have money change hands through the Murray exchange, and therefore it's a real price. All the other markets, there's zero trades, there's trades from one entity to another, etc., etc. It's, they're getting better, but, and also it sits in the middle. But if you look at that, we just plot the allocation for the year versus the weighted average price. So you add up in Murray Irrigation all the volume sold and you divide it by the total dollars. So if you'd bought, uh, you know, 1% of every parcel sold, this would be your average price over the whole year, right? And you can see there 2000 and this year or down here at that point, you can see 2019 up there very close. It's, it's, it's been holding um, over all that time. And yet the average price that's been paid has increased. And that's because there's less water. So if you go back to that, the curve stays the same but we're spending more time at this end of the curve than we used to. We used to spend a lot of time down there. With buyback, we're spending more time up here. So the two red stars there is the very dry year and the repeat of the millennium drought. Oh, sorry, the green. The green was the average in the last millennium drought. And if we had a repeat with buyback, that's what the price would be today. Now this is CPI adjusted. Have I confused everyone? Yeah, I'll try again. 
so in the in the millennium drought in today's dollars, not in dollars then, CPI adjusted, the average for the three years was six hundred dollars. If we had the same conditions again, we would have this much less water because of buyback. And if we project the curve, it would go from 600 to 750. Whereas down here, we used to have this much water, but because of buyback and all the rules, we've shifted right up to here. You know, buybacks only shifts us a little bit in those years and a big bit in these years in terms of water. Um, we've also had reducing interest rates over that period and we've had uh, horticulture and we've had productivity. So the curve stayed the same. Will it stay the same in the future? I don't know, but it has for the last while. Um, well, it's happened at the same time as we've had buyback. So you've had pluses and negatives and, and, they see, and productivity changes. Um, you know, if you think about your production 20 years ago to today, you're much higher, aren't you? And so that's enabled you to, to, to move up the curve. Those of you who are still standing, they haven't gone under, you've been able to move up the curve and be, be viable. Um, this is the projection for this year, and we take the 25% the, the to 50% aisles that the departments put out, and the day before they put it out, I ask people, I look up the Murray Exchange and see what the price is, and when I see what the price is, I can almost bet what the predictions are going to be the next day. The market gets it right ahead of the predictions, usually. And so what we've got at the moment is, and the current price is because of carryover. You, you don't pay as much today. First of July, the price is gonna go up because it's real water, not lost water. Um, but at the moment, we're looking at somewhere around 75, uh, 75 bucks is the projection for what next year's looking at um, in price. Uh, if, if Murrumbidgee gets 100%, and Murrumbidgee buggers this a bit because of the way the allocations happen up there. Um, but my view is that Murrumbidgee will get there and if Murrumbidgee gets there, then that blue dot is where the price is, how much water we're gonna have available, which is around the 50 bucks. What was the average price this year in MIL? What was the average, 120? What was the average weighted price? Do you know? Have a guess. What's your gut? Righto. Those who are less than 50, hands up. Those 50 to 75. Those above 75. Righto. It was smack on 50. Um, and with, uh, is, is the average. So if you just bought it through this year, that's what you would have paid um, on average. Um, we do this and we don't publicise it as much as we should. I'm, I love doing the stuff. I'm not very good at uh, marketing or sending it off. But if people want us want this, we we update this every time there's a there's a new allocation. If you want it, if you want to, you can send me an email and I'll circulate it if I remember. Um, now, this is the way over the last five years. This is the weighted price of all the different products. Um, this is South Australia, uh, Bidgee, uh, above the choke, below the choke, etc. The light green is your price there. And you can see how it, in a wetting and drying cycle, it goes. And it, what it does is people basically are doing, people are actually doing this. So in June, what do I reckon the we're going to allocations are going to be? I reckon it's about this price. Gets a bit wetter, mm, it's going over here, we drop the price. Oh, it's getting drier, they shift back up again. The, the market is collectively just doing this as you go through the season. So what you see is this, 
this trend, it's a, it's a sort of a, over time as we move through the, through the cycle. Um, and there's a little difference there between upstream and downstream and et cetera um, in terms of that. What's happening though is that the, as was said before, is that, oh, I'm up for time, am I? No, no, you've got 10 minutes. Right. Um, what we saw in, in early trading was that there were, and we're trading at the margins, there's no restrictions. As the volume of water traded is increasing, we start to hit restrictions like the choke, like the Goulburn, um, you know, Vigi, et cetera. And as we hit restrictions, we then, we're then starting to go back to separate markets a bit. And so at, at the moment, we're heading back a little bit to separate markets between the areas. And in terms of that, as, as we go to separate markets, and it's a bit cheaper, particularly above the choke in, in Victoria. Above the choke in Victoria is the area that you need to think about because that's where there's an opportunity for some high security water and horticulture. So if horticulture develops in there, they're going to put a bit of pressure on pulling water out of New South Wales into, in, in, in often. And, and at the moment, that area is actually a source of water for you because they're, with daring, they're not varying their water use much. And so this last year when we had a low security in there, the dairy farmers didn't use it and we had water come your direction. So, so your, your actual group at the moment to watch, I'm oh, sorry, if Murrumbidgee of course, because those of you who've got properties in both, you know, have really got it sorted. That's very smart if you're looking at the Bidgee. But in terms of your market, it's actually above the choke in, in Murray Valley, which is what's happening there that, 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 that you need to have a think about. Um, entitlement prices. This graph is showing the green is the Victorian Goulburn high reliability. The red is the Victorian high reliability above the choke and the New South Wales general security. And the, the dotted line is CPI. And you can see there that uh, there's been one hell of a change since 2012 to now. Um, and that's come about because 2012 was a wet period. And then we went into a dry and we had the impact of buyback. So that's with being less water. And if we look at this, these three graphs, I'll concentrate on, now let's do the Vic Goulburn one there. The dotted line, those of you who have got bank shares, um, how many have got bank shares? Right? How many of you know that you know dividends and bank shares are the key? Right? And when we look at, at the price of a bank share, it's related to the current expected dividends, isn't it? It's just a function of that. The entitlement prices are absolutely a function of dividends. Dividend is the, in other words, the allocation you get for an entitlement times the price for that year. So this last year, your dividend for a general security allocation was 50 bucks. You got 100% and you got $50 for it. Right? So what we've plotted here on the right hand side is the dividends. And what we've plotted on the left hand side is the entitlement price. And surprise, surprise, the dividends match the entitlement prices. And the dots are the, the, the uh, buyback prices where they paid above the market. Because uh, we're able to go into Murray, Murray's uh, trading and because they were fixed prices for buyback, we're able to take them out and, and, and show the difference. If you look at um, the one above, look at the Victorian Goulburn one there. Um, now your dividends 
are a different shape because general security allocations and high security and prices, the dividends aren't the same. You can't, they, you can't compare apples with apples in there. So that's why the Goldman dropped down the dividends so much, whereas you didn't. You might have had low allocations, but you had very high prices, etc. So that's what's happening. And if you look at that, you can see that even, so even though the dividends have been doing that, this curve has not changed. What's changed is that we spend some time up here. Well, sorry, we've moved up here because of buyback. We spend more time up here in dry, in dry periods, more time down here in wet periods. And that combined gives you this relationships. The dividend value there is the five year rolling average. So that's the average for the last five years. They are not individual year dividends, right? Because when you're looking at bank shares, you don't just go on to days, you look at you know, a bit of history. But as humans, we have short memories. So five years is about as long as we'll look backwards. After that, we forget about it. And we've plotted the five year relationship. So if you look at the average income for the last five years, and we've done that for every entitlement in the system. And you'll see there that except for the low security in Victoria, between three and about 4.7% is the average return that you would get on the price, on, the, on what you'd pay for an entitlement. So if I bought an entitlement in June 21, the previous five years income would give me a 4% rate of return. How much do you pay for land leasing? Sorry? Three, 4%. The entitlement price is a function of the allocation price. Hmm? Let's, let's just get the logic. Whoops. The allocation price is absolutely related to how much water is available in the, in the year. Rule number one. Rule number two is that the entitlement price is related to the five years or the, or the dividend income it's just a factor of the, the, of the allocation prices for the last five years. And it works out to be about 4%. If interest rates change, you would expect that the entitlement price will, will soften because you'll need more returns. Or it's cheaper to, um, um, so that they equalise out eventually. So when you look at the different entitlement prices through the systems, they're all very logical. You know, you hear this people manipulating the market and all the rest of it, and yes, there are clever people who muck around, but fundamentally, the market is logical. Um, water is an asset. Water is... Because Victoria has a stupid system, I say that as a Victorian, um, and I'm in New South Wales, so I'm in safe territory. Um, Victoria has a silly system of carryover, which has effectively meant when we introduce carryover that we're not getting any low, low, in, low allocations. However, New South Wales's carryover policy deficiency is that in the really good years, we limit you to 100%. We don't let you go hell for broke. And that also is a, is a, so both systems have their deficiencies and their strengths. They end up roughly the same, but yeah, New South Wales um, not letting you this, this coming season use the full allocation plus the 30, 50% is actually a change in policy. Um, Victoria did it another way, they've, they've changed it. Um, carryover is, carryover between the states is the same, but it's different. Water is generally around 20 to 40 percent of, of your assets. And one of the interesting debates that I don't win, but I'll keep 
prosecuting is that buying water is not an operating cost. Buying water is a finance cost. It's a cost of borrowing someone else's asset. And when you look at it in your, in your, in your um, farm business operations, treat it as an interest cost, because that's what it is. What you're doing is accessing unsecured water and you're paying for the privilege. Some people own lots of water and buy land and borrow from the bank and pay interest. Other people own their land and buy water on the temporary market. The total assets that you are using is the same. So that temporary market is just unsecured borrowing of someone else's assets. Um, now, where, I, where the other argument's correct, however, when you're doing a, mar a, a decision for this year, do I or don't I buy water, it then becomes in that equation of whether it's worth it in your gross margin. And that's when you put it in as an operating cost. But in a long-term strategic sense, if you're on the temporary market, it's just a form of borrowing and increasing your assets if that's what you're doing all the time. It's an unsecured borrowing, it's optional borrowing. I used to have people say taxes, taxes or interest. Um, interest is compulsory usually when you take out a loan, taxes are voluntary because you only pay them when you're making money. Um, temporary market is optional, which means in the, when it's expensive you can opt out and as as you, if you know your things, you can use it intelligently and you can pay a good interest rate, right? Um, if you don't buy in those expensive years, it might only be costing you 2%, whereas if you go to the bank, you pay five. Um, so that's, that's uh, strategically, you need to think in terms of that. Now, this is your question. Um, What's the temporary market price going to be in the future? The last 10 years average was 170 bucks. The five year wet, within that 10 years, was five years of wet and five years of dry. And the five years of wet was 61.80 and the five years of dry was 280. Within that last 10 years, it's one year out of date. Secondly, if water proceeds, and if it was 450 gigs taken out of the Southern Basin, we think that the average would go up by 50 bucks, roughly. That's how much you shift up the curve. If the 450 and the 605, it could even be higher. If I was betting, it'll be, won't be 450, but it'll be something. It'll be going up a bit. So if you're on the temporary market, you miss out on that capital gain. So depends on whether you think the 450 is going to go ahead or not. If you're convinced it's going to go ahead, put your money where your mouth is and go and buy water as hard as you can because you'll make money, your capital gain. Um, if you don't think it will, well you might be better off in the temp as well off in the temporary. Productivity is going to keep increasing and that will probably drive prices up a bit, particularly in your area or it'll accommodate less water. And what's happening is that horticulture uh, is modest productivity. The, the, the almonds and, and wine grapes can expand, but they're really at their limit of, they can't expand much more because there's no water downstream for them. So we're looking at horticulture upstream, which is the fresh fruit, which is labor. We talked before about the important, everything you do is cutting labour out. I mean, that's, that's laser grading is about getting rid of labour. You know, it's just, it's labour, labour, labour is what you're looking at all the time. And horticulture are in, are in a bit of a strife in fresh picking, although there was some robots going into an apple orchard. So, so that's, a, that's a difficulty. Dairy barns is really, in the 80s, we could run extension days on laser grading and you could just get them, you, you couldn't stop them coming in the, in the, in the, in, in the uh, field days. 
Um, it was the easy, you know, we used to think we were a good extension office back there. We weren't. It was just bloody timing. You know, I mean, anybody could have, anybody could have been an extension officer in the days of laser grading. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I ran a ran an automatic field day at Kerrang and we had what 600 or 700 p farm people turn up um, you know it's 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 and that was labor what we've got now in dairy barns they've just had one in Echuca they shut the door on on enrollments beforehand on the dairy barns 340 people it the interest is exploding and it's again it's it's about labor and water use efficiency dairy barns um, and the figures, the dairy barns shit on almonds. Uh, we'll outcompete them in terms of production per, per megalitre. Uh, their one challenge is milkers. Uh, and that is the, the challenge is getting people to milk the cows and we're close at robots. Cotton, clearly cotton is coming in here and is lifting you up that curve. Seed crops, you're moving up the curve but remember, as you move up the curve and, and compete, you're also wanting to be more secure. You're not happy with every second year rice crop or being in and out. If you're gonna invest in some of that, and, and what's more, it's not only investment in money, it's actually investment in skills. Did you hear how much skill there was in the talk before me? The skill of that business is unbelievable. And, and growing rice, is bloody easy compared to that farm operation. It's just enormously different. Um, and that's the challenge. And the challenge also is that to have that sort of skill, you can't just be a single operator. You've got to have a team, whether it's a family team or an employed team. And, and you know, getting that understanding of the whole different scale as you move up into that level of sophistication. The skill level of the three or four people in those businesses, and you can pick them around the district. There's some, you know, we had one story this morning, but there's probably a dozen or 20 of them around. Uh, are you that sort of person or can you access it? If you're not, perhaps going hell for leather for rice, understanding whether you want to be. Some people love it, um, love that sort of challenge. You know, the, the person leading the dairy barns is that sort of character. It's just, you know, there but so this whole person moving up the curve is going into a different mindset um, and the third one is that the trade is actually now bringing us back to a local area you know the the the, the, um, the tricks are, are getting harder um, and so you've got to think a bit more within within your local area for the next little while um, entitlements I think they're unlikely to keep going unless we get more buyback. We're going to see them much, much more go in, in tune with, with, um, with land prices and productivity. Um, interest rates are going to go up. This wet cycle, not for general security, but for the high security, is going to dampen entitlement prices. In the 11-12, we came out of the drought. We had buyback and how many times did you hear people say, oh, you don't need entitlements, you can just go on the allocation market, you know? Uh, there was a number of consultants who said that. Um, I was brought up with two grandfathers, and I think some of you heard me this, say this before. One grandfather used to say to me, and they're both really good farmers, one of them used to say, now young, young uh, Robbie, he used to call me Robbie and I hated it, he, he used to say, now young Robbie, if you haven't got the money in your pocket, you can't spend it. And the other grandfather used to say, if you're not using someone else's money, you're not taking, making the most of opportunities. So no wonder I'm conflicted. But the one grandfather who said it wasn't in the pocket, he got given his, they worked as a family, they paid off the farm and then he got given it. So he was debt free from day one, hit the depression and he bought land in the depression because he was cashed up. So when you're debt free, You've got to take advantages of the down the counter cycles because you can. The other grandfather was kicked out with barely the deposit and, and had debt up to here all his life, and he just that was normal. And and that's the way he farmed. But in the in in the in he had to buy in good times when prices were high. So he always paid more. 
And so there's a different way of thinking. And so with entitlements, that's the same here. How much do you own? How much do you borrow, etc.? It's a different system and you've got to understand it. Some general rules to finish on, and I don't need to say this because it's already been said. You've got to go for broke when there's plenty of water. And you've got to take a bit of a risk so you can go for broke in your general security situation. Um, you've got to know your break even point. And we did the gross margins up there. And what I want you to do is all go home and, and forget about the numbers in that table. Think about the principle and put your numbers in and look in the mirror when you put your numbers in and be honest. Because some of you are better than you think you are and, and you're not taking advantage of it. Some of you aren't nearly as good as you think you are. You know, that's human nature. Make sure you know what your income is. And when you work out the dollars per megalitre, take off the dry land. You know, we heard, what can you, what can you make on dry land? The irrigation's only worth that extra bit. Otherwise, do dry land. Um, so go for broke. Um, cut your losses early in drought, you know. Um, but look for alternatives in drought. You know, you've got to be flexible. Um, Human behaviour is predictable, I said that three times. Um, now with carryover, you know, this year, the best people would have been, with hindsight, those who went for hell for that leather, then paid, and I heard of someone buying at $1.50 the other day to fill up their carryover, just in case we don't get it. Um, and how many of you are going to take a punt next year and plant more than you think you, than you've got water for with the assumption you're going to buy and you're going to buy some for carryover next year. So to me, you've got to think about how much water you got, use all of that, plus how much more can you buy, use all of that, and then I'll buy some for carryover for the next year. That's the mindset that we've got to have today. Now, when we did that benchmarking, we were in the complete opposite mindset. We were, how do you manage lack of water, right? Um, and of course, the lessons from that lack of water is something you should have in the back of your mind because in about 18 months time, two years, that's when you should be thinking about that. Probably, depending on what we're gonna get. Um, climate change probably doesn't fit in. Climate change in your planning in the short term isn't gonna make it's going to make a difference, but it's just part of the variability that you're managing with. And the other is you've got to see trends. You've got to step back and see the trends and, be, and, and see where it's going. You know, don't, don't be, the, don't be the, the first with the new or the last with the old, but make sure you see the trends. And the trends are clear that, that you've got two choices here. You either be conservative, and I don't mean conservative, that's not a, sorry, that is not a negative uh, value. Be conservative, be rice growers, go for hell, swing in and out. Or be innovative, skills, flexible, and go for some of the high stuff. Whichever one you do, you've got to do it well. Um, or you won't be here, because half of you won't be in 20 years time. <laughs>